Richard Browning, absolute pleasure. I'm loving I'm loving the, the typical inventor's backdrop. <laughs> yeah. What what are you currently 3D printing? Um it is a replacement engine cowl for one of the arm engines. You know you've got two little engines on each arm. Um it's a replacement cowl for one of those. We reckon we can print them in that machine. So um that machine has been employed very heavily in the last uh, couple of weeks doing uh visors. We uh we put out this story um a uh, couple of weeks ago where we share what we were doing. You know, the sort of uh, virus kind of, um, uh, you know, protective visor systems that you might see people build, you know, building on, on um, uh, you know, with 3D printers showing online. Uh, we've, we've done 120, I think now. So that machine has been nearly entirely doing NHS stuff rather than actually stuff for us. We've actually run out of the visor material now. So it's back to printing stuff for us. So, yeah, right, good effort. Great machine. Good effort on that side, mate. Uh, on the, I mean, invention side, I know you from obviously the the uh, in inverted commas the real life Ironman side of things, um, which I, we will we will come on to definitely. The gravity industries, right? Yes. Did you when you were a kid in in inventing? When did the sort of the, the inventor side of you come out? Did it start as a when you were a kid, or did it come out through your entrepreneurial spirit? I time and on? No, I I grew up the. Uh, making building breaking taking things apart with my father in his workshop um, ever since i was small i was much more interested in taking part in old tv than than uh, you know building some meccano or something I, I i love the 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 kind of discovery element of taking apart something that um you know that may, maybe was verging on the maybe not recommended certainly that would be the case for one of those old tvs but uh, um yeah I, I i've always been I suppose that way inclined. I've always been curious. Uh, the more I'm told to do something, the more I'm inclined to wonder what else is over the horizon that I'm not being told about. And I suppose that's all part of being that kind of curious inventor kind of mindset. So no, what I've done with gravity and building these jet suits and building this company is, um, is closer to home than my 16 year career in the oil industry in the city. That was, uh, that was really a means to an end rather than my kind of natural calling. I would say, I think I've always been that sort of designer inventor mindset so so what we sorry what we do before in the city finance yeah i was an oil trader with bp so i used to buy and sell oil cargoes around the world do deals with all sorts of uh, interesting and unusual countries and individuals i mean oligarchs in azerbaijan and libya in gaddafi's era and uh china russia all sorts of places i mean it was a really interesting uh kind of cross section of the world to try and operate in and certainly taught me a lot about business but it was never really my passion I got plenty of opportunities to, I suppose, exercise my entrepreneurial spirit in that role because running a trading book is, is all about taking risk, managing risk, and you know, hopefully, eventually coming out up. <laughs> so it's actually not 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 dissimilar to the process you go through when you're a designer, inventor, and entrepreneur. I mean, you're taking risks that you hope you can manage the downside of, um, and eventually, you know, uh, emerge the other end with a with more successes than failures. So actually, yeah, it was a similar kind of place, but. Obviously, as part of a big company, it's nothing like the autonomy I have now as running my own. So, uh, but yeah, that was a big part of my life. Do you uh, do you still manage to maintain the the sort of the big calculated type of risk and all the analysis and assessment that goes into that business, especially the oil world? Do you manage to maintain that in depth analysis of risk in in what you do now? Or is, or, or is it oh, less yeah. so? No, I, I mean, it, it, it's just different kinds of risk. I mean, yeah, if you want to get kind of more deep about it, I mean, uh, we, we constantly look at three types of risk. I mean, it, it's, it's obviously financial risk for the company. If we throw, spend some of our finite resources on an experiment uh, building a, a different kind of jet suit, we blow all our money on it and it doesn't work. That's a silly risk to take because we can't recover from the downside. But there's two other buckets of risk we seriously worry about. One is reputation. You know, at an event, if I see a double-decker bus going past, and I think, you know what, it'd be really fun to go and surf that into town and then fly back again. I bet it would go viral. You know, I, I can I can certainly list quite a few times when I've been tempted to do that kind of thing, but I never have because I know we won't get invited back to any of the, you know. I mean, we've done 103 events in 30 countries around the world, some of the most high-profile, uh, you know, events you can imagine for people like Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, uh, you know, Richard Branson, all these people. You don't get invited back if you take that kind of reputation risk, and all the regulators and authorities are... You know, I, I'd like to say supportive of us. None of them are against us. I wouldn't say that they uh, that they they rush to endorse us, but they they certainly have never stopped us and 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 you know enjoy what we do. But that's come through 
you know, building that reputation. And then finally, the most important risk, arguably more important than the risk I used to have to manage as an oil trader is safety. I could absolutely strap on any one of these suits sitting in the back here. And yeah, probably within about five minutes of standing here or sitting here now in a t-shirt and shorts, I could be at 2000 feet in the air. Now, do I want to go and do that? No, because you know what? If in the tiny chance there's a slight problem with one of the engines or something, I'm not going to get to have another go. So risk management is critical to you know running a business and being an entrepreneur, I think, and running a trading book. Uh, the, I mean, it brings us on to, uh, you know, we talk about risk. It's not exactly that, that it, well, from, from relatively speaking, it's not exactly the, the safest, the safest stuff you're working on. So where did, where did the idea to start working on a, a system that could propel a human being a jet suit, where did that come from? Why that angle? What was the spark? Yeah. So, I mean, I firstly say a bit like a very fast sort of sports motorbike or a Formula One car or whatever. No, they don't have to be dangerous. It's entirely how you behave with them. They open the potential of, of danger uh, or they carry with them the potential of danger. But what we do is not inherently dangerous if you're sensible and you understand what you're doing with it. But anyway, I'll come back to that. Um, so a lot of my inspiration actually came from my time alongside my career, and my time doing um, a variety of kind of challenging things. So I used to run ultramarathons, I used to race triathlon, and then I spent about six years in the Royal Marines Reserve as well. So that, all, well, all of those, I suppose, scenarios taught me, probably similar to your background, uh, you know, with Paris, that you go through a journey, a self-discovery journey of realizing you can push yourself a lot further than you probably imagined. And the self-confidence that you get from that leads you to look around the world and think, well, you know what, in whatever realm, in my case, it was aviation and flight, which is inspired a lot by my family background. But um, when it comes to human flight, I wonder, just for fun, no real commercial serious reason behind it, just for fun, imagine if you could actually support your body weight on a degree of propulsion rather than leaning on a desk or a chair or a bathroom sink rather than leaning on those what if i was leaning on the momentary support of a form of propulsion well i can hold myself and back in the day i used to be able to hold a plant and stuff this is a pretty ridiculous and sort of athletic maneuver like doing a press up without your feet on the ground um then well screw it i think i can i can kind of have a run at producing a whole new form of kind of human flight again I want to reinforce this point for no sensible reason whatsoever. I just thought it would be cool. Um, so I, I realized um, that everything I thought I needed to do to be able to achieve it was, was in my gift. So I knew enough about gas turbines. I knew enough about the control systems. I can build most things out of, you know, aluminium and, you know, rivet things, bolt things together and stuff from my you know, childhood experience. So I suddenly realized I, I could do most of this in my evenings and weekends. So, yeah, and there, there's... You know, there's, there's a lot on YouTube, a lot on Instagram. There's five TED Talks now, including the big TED 2017 talk. You know, if you Google for Richard Browning TED Talk or the, the YouTube, particularly, we're putting a lot of content on there during this lockdown period. Uh, if you search for take on gravity or gravity industries, particularly gravity industries on YouTube, um, you can see the kind of, well, it, you know, almost ludicrous steps I went through of, of fixing jet engines to different parts of my body and working out what works and what didn't. All the time, again, being safe, but... Um, yeah, I, I just thought it would be something really cool to do. I thought it would be something that conventional received wisdom suggested was impossible. And I, I kind of absolutely love it when there's people say things can't be done and you just quietly prove that you can do it. You know, I bet you going through P Company, I bet there was voices in your head or even maybe real voices in your circle of friends or family that maybe you thought you couldn't necessarily get through it. And isn't it damn satisfying when you prove to yourself and everybody else, you know, that you actually can. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, you're right. And that, and, and that, I mean, it's an interesting point you raise there, mate, is, is uh, we're very lucky, I think, you and I, and other people have experienced it. In Where myself, I've been forced into that, pushing the envelope of my physical and mental abilities. But either way, I've come out the other end and gone, okay, and, and I know I can push myself, and I, I can only bet myself in doing that. Other people don't have that benefit. I think that's what you've experienced. And it's really interesting, the ultra-running ba background as well just again pushing yourself into uncomfort because it's where you discover things you oh, discover massive. things about yourself or you discover things about there's there's not you know there are very few free things in life really and and by pushing yourself either either voluntarily or being forced by circumstance and to be honest most 
you know, there's a very common trend with people who achieve unusual things uh, that, that often you look at their background and something pretty bad has usually happened, which has forced them to discover in themselves a degree of confidence or motivation that otherwise they naturally probably wouldn't have had. You know, that, that probably applies, well, it definitely applies to me with my childhood. Um, and if you can run with that and not let that defeat you, or just even self-generate that, you don't have to have to have had some, you know, unfortunate childhood. It, the payback is massive. You put yourself in that discomfort and you cling on and you keep pushing and you have the faith and you find some strength from somewhere. And whether you're setting up a startup or getting your ass off the couch to run a 5K park run when we're allowed to do those kind of things again, um, then it's the same journey. It's the same, it's the same energy to go a bit beyond what you think you can do. And the reward, it might not come in the first attempt or the 20th, but the, it will come eventually. You know, and, and this, this, you know, flying around with jet suits, <laughs> um, it might look pretty outrageous to people, but I mean, I, it, it is tempered by the fact that I, in my, you know, in my life, I've tried countless entrepreneurial things in my time, and no, most of which, many of which have not worked. And, and it, I've always made sure that the failure, I can get myself back up again, both practically and emotionally, and then have another go. And then every now and then, something does work. And that's where you make the big leap. You know, I, I've stood on stages all over the world uh, and described this process of going down the untrodden, untrodden pathway where the signposts are saying, well, that's stupid, it's never gonna work. That's dangerous or idiotic or what's the point? But I get excited when I see those signposts because I know that they, you know, they would have put most people off. And that's where the opportunity is. If you go down a pathway where other, everybody else has already been, well, guess what? It's low risk. It's probably going to work. But everybody else has already been there. I just find that really not exciting. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I can see what you're saying. The, you mentioned earlier um, the, uh, the the family connection to aviation, and you yeah. and you. What is that connection? And because you also, I mean, you talked about you, you were in the city finance oil, but you've also obviously got a really good grasp you had it before that this journey started on engineering you mentioned turbines so what's the family connection and, and where does that foundation knowledge come from uh yeah so uh one grandfather was a civil airline pilot and before that a wartime pilot um my other grandfather was Sir Basil Blackwell he used to run Westland helicopters that's now become Leonardo uh but I mean I I believe I was a baby being ferried around in a helicopter on a, on a couple of occasions but I mean it it was great growing up around him, uh, my grandfather, and just absorbing ideas, knowledge, and things. And then my father, um, he died when I was 15, unfortunately, um, from a failed business venture. You know, he took his own life in that process, which is the bit I was talking about, about where you learn the hard way. Um, but he was a maverick inventor and designer and entrepreneur, and um, he invented the first uh, mountain bike suspension, for instance. He invented amazing folding bikes, and he was an aeronautical engineer. I, I could have described to you at probably age 10 the, the physics principles about how a helicopter takes off with a swash plate and how the swash plate then will rise up to, to change the pitch of all the blades simultaneously and then tilt forward, which changes the lift on the rotor disc higher at the back versus the front, which makes it tilt. I could describe all that to you probably when I was 10, just because he used to talk about that all the time. So, yeah, understanding and being confident enough around a gas turbine, albeit a small one, um didn't seem much of a leap to me so i have a huge amount to thank that family background if you like um to to give me the confidence to go down this route um but yeah it, it's funny it all this only dawned on me only in the last couple of years really i i didn't have any pre-planned destination you know in my mind i i went into into business forget the fact it's oil it could have been any kind of business but I went into that purely because I wanted to go and, yes, get lots of experience, but mostly build a financial safety net for myself that I experienced the lack of when I was a kid. Um, mm. And, and that the last thing on my mind was to go and throw everything that I had at some crazy idea of, you know, some startup or something when I couldn't emotionally imagine coping with the downside of that then failing because I lived through that as a child. So I've had to build this safety net first before I then open the taps on the crazy father legacy to go and do something as mad as run a jet suit company <laughs> brings us brings us uh, nicely onto the jet suit one of the one of the early iterations of it i i seen and it's i think it's it's your first test flight i think you're in it you're in a yard in fact it might be one of the recent videos you uploaded youtube an old one 
And in it, you've got you've got um, turbines on your arms. Yeah. And on your legs. Now, one of the things that strikes me with the jet suit is I've always, when I've seen you flying about in it, that, that what strikes me is it must be incredible pressure on your arms with flying about. The, the, the pressure on your arms and your shoulders and the strength it must take. You mentioned the, yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the, the planche earlier. Why did you why did you bin off the leg turbines? Yes, so, it must so, have made it easier. <laughs> as you well, right, right. So let, let's cover this. And there is there is a couple of YouTube where we specifically tackle this question because we get it a lot. So yes, you're very you're, you're correct to say in November 2016, some five six months after I first started experimenting, I achieved the very first kind of jet suit flight of six seconds across this Wiltshire farmyard. Uh, but it was a big moment. And it, it was achieved by having two engines on each arm and one on the back of each leg on your calf area. And you'd think, because your legs are designed to take your body weight, you'd think that would be a good idea, right? And, and it did work, but it was like balancing. It, it, I looked like a puppet. I was balancing all four limbs. And, and as you feel the thrust come up the back of your leg, you start to rise up. But then you want to almost pedal your feet trying to find the ground again. It's a very weird feeling. And as soon as you bend your knee, the thrust now isn't pushing you upwards. It's starting to rotate you. So you have to hugely concentrate. It's the whole patting the head and rubbing the stomach kind of thing, except with four limbs. Um, it's doable, but hard. What we realize, if you slide those two leg engines up to about your arse level, then suddenly you don't have them attached to flappy limbs anymore. They are just doing a good job of lifting you by the belt kind of thing. Now, what we realize is that if you think, if you think of two engines on each arm and two round the back, you've essentially got six thrust vectors and if you simplify that to three thrust vectors, so two engines on one arm, two engines on the other, and two on the back, you've really got a three-legged camera tripod. That's why it's so stable. You've got three solid, stable thrust vectors. Now, oh. you're not lifting all your body weight because the rear engines, uh, and at that time it was two, and it's now, for the last two and a half years, has been one larger one, which is roughly the same power as, as each arm. There is a bit more power in that bigger engine because it allows you to lift more fuel. But let's, for the sake of argument, say it's just another third. That's lifting all the equipment and almost a third of your body weight, which means that if you lean like this, this evening, if, if you know people listening to this, lean forward with roughly straight arms on their you know kitchen sink, worktop, a chair, or even a bathroom sink, but be careful because it might come off the wall. But if you just lean forward and you're standing ideally on some bathroom scales. Keep leaning forward with those straight arms until one third of your body weight is left registering on the bathroom scale. And that's what it feels like to fly. You'll be surprised at how ridiculously easy it is. You're just leaning forward with roughly straight arms. So we, we've had 70 year olds come and learn to fly with us as clients. It, it, it's, it's annoying because once you've learned it, and some people only take a day, even less than that sometimes to learn this with the tether. It's annoying because once you've learned it, you realize it's actually very easy. Like with most things, when you're learning, and you're vectoring your arms up and down and stuff, it can get tiring. But once you've learnt it, now it's 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 effortless. I mean, look at my face in all the clips or any of my pilots when they're flying. Do they look stressed? No, they're just grinning like idiots flying around. <laughs> so no, it, it's it's really not not very difficult. Now, the other challenges of having the engines on the legs, on the lower legs, is that the thrust, the exhaust coming out, is coming out at very high velocity. Um, that velocity drops off very quickly with distance from the ground. So by the time the engines are on your ass or even now on your back, the velocity isn't that bad. You can take off from grass. It'll throw the dead grass up in the air and, you know, it's not ideal, but you can do it. If you put the engines on the legs, you will literally dig a sort of eight inch hole in the ground of soil or grass where you try and take off. So some people might be familiar with the French hoverboard, for instance. You know, it's a super cool system in a lot of ways. But the problem is you have to land and take off from a raised grated platform. Because the engines are even worse. They're under his feet. So the higher you can keep the engines off the ground, the more mobile and nimble you are because you can land and take off anywhere. So French, French hoverboard. Yeah, there's a guy called Frankie Zapata. Um, he's built like a sort of jet engine powered hoverboard thing. I mean, you, you imagine you're like surfing around on a hoverboard. Um, it, he, he, he's done some pretty cool stuff with it. Um, but it suffers from that problem. He has to land and take off from the same point each time. Whereas, you know, I mean, again, just look at our social media. You can land and take off from vehicles or boats or do anything you like. So th there's a number of challenges. I mean, there's another one I can throw at you, which is the exhaust from the arm engines. If you vector downwards, in other words, sort of lower your arms, like a sort of penguin motion, you, as you lower your arms, if the hot exhaust from those engines goes into the intakes of the leg engines, 
you can melt all the turbine blades out. I mean, it, it, it just shuts the engine down. You know, they don't want to breathe in hot air. They want to breathe in nice cold air and then expand it to create the thrust. So there's a number of challenges with leg engines, but we might one day bring them back as an extra augmentation for the race series. So you take off with them idling. And then when you really want to gun it super fast, you'll just, just really like hammer them for another 20, 30 kilos of thrust and like accelerate around a corner and stuff. I think that could look pretty epic. But anyway, <laughs> that's all going to come in the race series. I didn't, it, I didn't realize you were, uh, you're having people in to, to, to fly about in it. The, so, sorry, just what, what's the current model called? So, I mean, we, we call it, so the, the very first, of the first original version, which had uh, six little engines, originally two on the back, you know, of your legs. Um, and then they moved up to your sort of arse level. Um, that was called the sort of Daedalus Mark One. Daedalus I mean, is, the, is the son of Icarus. It was a kind of fun name to uh, apply to the suit. Anyway, that, that was the first one. We now fly what we call the Mark II, which is two engines on each arm and one bigger one on the back. Um, same principle, but just a hugely proven platform of which there's six, four, you know, five suits sitting behind there in my, in my shop behind me. Yep. That, those have flown all over the world. Like I say, 30 separate countries, 100 events. They pack into two check-in suitcases. When there isn't a virus uh, rife in the world, then you can get on a plane and go anywhere in the world and get some diesel from a gas station and go flying those anywhere. Um, the Mark III is the one we're prototyping now, which is going to be a huge improvement of that one. So really the Mark II jet suit. And it, it runs on diesel. Yeah, it's another thing that there's so many, there's so many uh, misconceptions in the, in the world we operate in, which is probably why I've ended up doing it, because actually I just crash through all these misconceptions without really caring. But um, yeah, so if I tell you it runs off jet fuel, probably the first thought in your mind is, oh my God, you know, how, how many seconds till you explode into a fireball and, you know, it must be amazing, you know, it must be terribly dangerous. If I said to you it runs off diesel, that you run a tractor off, do you have the same thought process? No. And yet, no. you know what? They are essentially the same fuel. Diesel and jet fuel are the same thing. The only slight difference is jet fuel is refined to be a bit cleaner and, and a higher spec because you'd hope this so it doesn't stand much chance at all of shutting down a gas turbine when you're going on holiday in a jet plane. Um, and it's got a very slightly um, more um, sort of optimistic um, flashpoint. In other words, it'll, it'll ignite very slightly easier. But you know what? And I'm really not encouraging people to try this. You can put matches out in diesel. You can drop matches in it and they go out, right? If you hold it just close to the surface for a while, you'll eventually get a bit of vaporization and eventually get a flame. And when you do get a flame, over about 60, 30 to 60 seconds, it will gradually build into a nice, very hot, but sort of bonfire. That's it. It's like burning a large candle. Well, guess what? Jet fuel does the same thing. Uh, so our engines don't really care whether it's jet fuel, um, diesel, kerosene, paraffin. They're all very similar. Uh. Jet, jet fuel, I'd say, burns cleaner and is nicer. You don't disappear in a cloud of smoke when you shut down. Uh, you do with diesel, but uh, yeah. But I'm much happier flying this knowing it's not like gas leader or anything. I mean, that would be very scary. If if you've got people coming in to fly around in your suits, is there a calibration that has to happen for the suit relative to their weight? Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, we do client training. We do it in L.A. and, and the U.K. Uh, we have people come along to our training rig. Again, there's lots of clips on uh, Instagram at Take On Gravity and, and our YouTube. Um, yeah, you just clip, get clipped in like you're going rock climbing. And the idea is you're on very low power, squeeze the trigger and realize, oh, apart from making lots of noise, but you've got ear defenders on. You just feel this gentle push and you just lean into the push and you realize it's entirely in your control. And as you get lighter and lighter and jump around like you're on the moon, um, you increasingly don't need the tether. But I mean, we keep people on it just as a safety so they can't fall over. And they learn often within a day. So we've done about 60 different clients from around the world. Um, you're right to say it needs to be calibrated. It's air temperature and their weight and the fuel weight are the three variables, the three main variables. But what we do is we have a little rocker switch in one side. So every time you click the switch up, you get a little bit more power. It, there's like a trigger, which you just squeeze on all the way. It means that if you want to let it go back to idle, you just let go and it drops back to idle. But you fly it with it held on all the way. But the gross amount of power that produces is entirely controllable with a rocker switch. So to begin with, we keep it very low. And as they get more and more confident, they themselves click it up. I mean, we can remotely shut it down, but... Um, they'll keep clicking it up gradually and incrementally until they get to a level where their, te their feet are just gently drifting off the ground. So they find their own equilibrium, in other words. What's the, uh, 
what's the ceiling on it in terms of altitude, do you reckon? Um, I mean, technically, probably about 12,000 feet. But, I mean, we just, we have this, we had this realisation a couple of years ago, which is, it's natural human instinct to ask how high can you go. But then when you really unpack that and ask, well, why do you want to go that high? It's, it's like a natural human instinct to, to sort of wonder what's up there. But, I mean, it just gets exceptionally dangerous, very cold. The engines don't produce so much thrust. And the only reason that jet airliners go up there is because of the lack of air resistance, which it more than compensates for the lack of propulsion from the gas turbines, which means that they use vastly less fuel to go 600 miles an hour. Why the hell would we go up there? So from mm -hmm. a military point of view and a search and rescue point of view and an entertainment point of view, why the hell do we need to go more than about 20 feet? Um, it doesn't push off the ground. It actually gets easier when you've gone above about 15 feet and upwards. Um, but we just decided there's just not much upside. I mean, some of the wing testing we've done has seen us go a bit higher over water, but it's just nice to uh, just eliminate the absolute risk of death if you were constantly buzzing around at a thousand feet. I mean, it's just pointless. Yeah, it's a good point. If there's no point, then what's the no, point? No, yeah. it's a very regular question, but it's just really funny when you when you have this conversation. People go, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Actually, there's nothing up there. And if you're doing it for a crowd of 30,000 people, you suddenly turn into an inanimate black dot. Whereas if you're 20 feet grinning at them, they love it. They, it looks like a real life, you know, superhero film. Yeah. What? So, and we talked about height. What's the what are the safety systems on it, if any? So, in terms of, yeah. Well, there we go. That's the question. Yeah. What are the safety no, no, systems? No. How do they work? Um, yeah. So, with the way that we fly without the wings, anyway, then you don't glide. I mean, you've got, you know, if you lose an engine on, on one of the arms you will just start to rotate and drop from where you were. Um, it's not possible to get another engine to step in, in in its place if there's a real proper sudden shutdown. Um, and unlike a helicopter or an aircraft uh, or a you know, fixed wing aircraft, we can't glide. Um, therefore, you don't fly very high or you fly over water. Um, the nice thing, though, uh, is that if you do get a failure, the only way you can fail is go down. There is no gyroscope or ECU or computing involved, which would suddenly freeze or have a mad day out where you'd get locked into some massive unplanned climb. You just can't do that. You know, you just, you always fail to the downside. So we, you know, my pilots and I always have this kind of constant assessment at events. You scan the ground in front of you and think, look, would I reluctantly accept falling at any moment during my flight? And over water, like I say, it's, it's fine. But, you know, if you're doing some crazy stunt jumping over a car, you know, what, where exactly are you going to land if you're going to fail right at the top of that arc? You know, if it's the equivalent of falling off a push bike or a motorbike, then, well, you know, it's not going to be a fun day out, but you'll accept it. If you're flying over some spiky fence or something like that, you know, you've got to ask yourself, even though it's a tiny fractional chance of it happening, we just try to eliminate those risks. What, what's the weight on the suit? I'm just thinking of falling with all that kit on. <laughs> Um, oh, I mean, fueled up, it's a, oh, unfueled, it's about 20, uh, 25 kilos, and so it's about 30, 30 kilos or so. It's a bit like kind of fighting, you know, fighting order kind of backpack and weapon in a way in terms of the weight. But when you're flying, you don't feel anything of it. But uh, it does afford you quite a lot of protection, though. It stabilizes your back. You've got a neck brace and a helmet. And, you know, I've fallen, again, I put a load of fails up on our YouTube um, I've fallen, you know, at least half a dozen times in various circumstances. And, you know, it's, it's not fun, but it's uh, we've done it in a scenario where it's been recoverable every time. What uh, what are the what do you see the uh, again, you've probably been asked this. I'm going to ask you what do you see the most. What sorry, what have been the most unusual, unexpected potential applications for your suit? That have, that have come about. I mean, there's, ob there's obvious applications, yeah. obviously, that, but what are the unexpected and interesting ones that have sort of got you thinking onto the next step? Well, I mean, if I just cover, so, so what, what, what's happened since we launched, uh, where I had, no, I had no plan at all. I just thought it'd be cool, and it had this massive effect on people who saw it live, and we thought, why don't we package up, it up in the form of a company? We formed the company Gravity, and we've kind of just scaled from there at events. And training clients have been an amazing, unexpected revenue stream. Um, the main purpose, if you like, I think the core purpose at the moment falls into the same bucket as, as, a, as a Formula One car or a rally car or an Indy car or a NASCAR. You know, what the hell is the point in all those vehicles? They don't do anything practical at all. 
but they entertain, they inspire people, and they leave a trail of interesting technology that gets, you know, more widely applied. So in a baby way, we can definitely do the same thing. And we've sort of accidentally polled several million people around the world live from doing over 100 events. And consistently, people have lost their mind when they see this live. They, they always have this autistic reaction going, this looks even more fake than it does online. And yet I've just seen it and smelt it and felt it. I want to see more. I want to see five or six pilots all race each other. This is awesome. This is like a sort of real life, um, you know, kind of human Marvel meets Red Bull Air Race kind of inspiring thing. Um, so the, the purpose, if you like, is there for entertainment, inspiration and, and just, you know, creating content. Now, that, that's the primary easy win. It doesn't sound very admirable, but in the weird world with iPhones and Google and, you know, Facebook and whatever, that's enough to justify the journey and to fuel our journey, making the equipment better and better. Now, when it comes to practical applications, uh, special forces, niche special forces, ingress, exfil, uh, and also search and rescue. We're, we've done over a dozen military exercises now, and we're fully ingrained now in US and UK military, um, faster and to a greater extent than I ever imagined. But I mean, we've got to see that play out. Um, in addition to that, giving people an, enter you know, an entertainment, exciting experience, you know, learning to fly these. Those are our three main areas. Now, in terms of becoming a mainstream technology, at the moment, no. I mean, it consumes quite a lot of fuel. It's very noisy, potentially dangerous if you don't know what you're doing with it. It would be like taking the kids to school in a Formula One car. You know, you could if you really had to, but not sensible. Um, but then again, I often have people say to me, you know, the first motor cars were considered noisy, smelly and inefficient and rubbish compared to the incumbent technology, which was a horse. Why bother moving from a horse? Well, look where cars have got to. So, you know, in some ways, as energy storage improves, battery technology improves, we might get to a stage where the electric prototype, which is sitting up on the wall around here, actually becomes more viable. And then you're in a different world. Then you're in a world which is quieter, cleaner, more controllable. And, you know, maybe for a sort of solo commuting to a short distance to work or something, maybe maybe might have future, you know, some future. But uh, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it because we're having too much fun in the meantime. <laughs> I, so electric that i mean that was going to be my next question is on the electric side of things but if you is it a working prototype that you've got yeah i mean there's again there's a clip on instagram we, we shared with one of my team with it um i mean the the, the the shocking figure that that will explain why this is difficult is that if you get a um a kilo weight of jet fuel or diesel to get the equivalent energy in batteries you need 60 kilos so a factor of 60 and even the most optimistic crazy batteries is more like 40. You need, let's say, even 50 times the weight in batteries that you do, you know, gasly, diesel, petrol. That's your killer. That's the problem. We, we've all grown up with this amazing, you know, petroleum products that, you know, I, I, they do cause problems, clearly. But they are an amazing, dense, controllable form of energy that is very hard to beat. So when we're in the business of flying and we care about every kilo, that's a real hard challenge. And also, ironically, when we've been testing with various electric systems, it's felt more dangerous flying around with a whole bunch of lithium strapped to your back than it has diesel. Because if you hit that, you know, those lithium batteries and they start to, you know, self-combust, they're very hard to put out. So you need to make sure you can get that off you pretty quickly. So there's a number of problems, but we're keeping a watching brief on it. Have you tinkered with hydrogen? Mm. Is that a possibility? Yeah, so hydrogen is an interesting one. So in theory, it's interesting. The challenge is that the weight of the container and the danger of the container is a problem. So you need like a sort of diving bottle on your back. Um, you could take, you could, we can have the same argument uh, or debate around cars running on hydrogen. You can do it, but the weight and complexity and cost of the storage vessel is such that it makes it really quite inefficient. Rather than having a pressed, you know, pressed steel petrol or diesel tank that doesn't cost anything to make that sits there under no pressure with the fuel sloshing around inside it really easy compared to taking up your whole boot space with a compressed dive cylinder type hydrogen thing which by the way if you have a rear end accident they're not going to need to ask for an ambulance because there's just going to be a crater left where you were you know it's all of those problems which kind of put us off um you know you can't travel with it you can't buy it very easily um, it's just difficult. I mean, but it, it's lovely because it produces water vapor as a few, as a, as a, you know, um, as an exhaust. 
I, I thought BP were working on a hydrogen-powered car. Oh, I mean, uh, not so much. No, BP wouldn't be working on the car, but um, most oil companies have worked on hydrogen refueling. Um, and several car companies have worked on and created hydrogen cars, but they suffer from the problem I described. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, the, one of the biggest problems in alternative fuels, I mean, this is, this is my BP life now, but is it, even if hydrogen was brilliant, the billions it costs to create an infrastructure that means you can drive your hydrogen car 20 miles and be pretty confident you can find a hydrogen refueling station, that's a big ask. I mean, it's an entirely new infrastructure you know the electric car people have got the same problem you know they're going to have to have new substations and new transmission lines and you know it's difficult what's uh what's the range on the suit mate um so it's easier to talk in terms of flight time so if you stuff fuel in like that one sitting there yeah. uh, which is a pretty standard one that can take about 20 liters that will do about four minutes of flight time it doesn't sound very much but you can go take off from the palm of my hand pretty much size land you know launch pad fly well, I mean, I've done 85 miles an hour, but let's just say 60 miles an hour for easy maths. Um, and you can go anywhere in three-dimensional space in any direction, you know, for, um, well, therefore four miles. But um, realistically, it, it's usually two, three, four kilometers kind of range. Nearly all the events we do, like the one I just, I've just today posted up a really quite cool thing. In fact, you should watch this being ex-military. Uh, we did the Overton Air Show, so the fleet air arm. Uh, the jungly assault with a load of um, helicopters and fireballs and all sorts of me and two other pilots, one of whom was an ex Harrier pilot, all flew the jungly assault. Uh, and we've thrown up all the behind the scenes stuff in there as well, which is quite cool. Um, I flew the entire frontage of the air show crowd there and back. And I think that was something like, I can't remember now, I'll probably get picked up by people remembering exactly what it was, but it was something like three quarters of a mile. And I did the whole thing in, well, and you see the speed I put up on the screen uh, in one of the edits um, at about 57 miles an hour or so. I mean, you can just hit that speed instantly. Um, so you can travel ridiculous distances in it, given how small the equipment is. What, um, what's your no-fly limit for wind? Nothing, really. Um, I mean, really? on the basis, I, yeah, no, wind, wind is one of our least troublesome problems because if you think about it we don't have wings so we don't catch the air um most aircraft you know have, have rotor blades or wings and therefore they're going to get disrupted and disturbed by the wind that's going to hit them well i mean if it's gusting 20 miles an hour and you're walking down the high street you, you tell me how difficult is that you just kind of lean into it a bit more every now and then and that's about it right i'll blow your clothes around i feel exactly the same when i'm flying except i've now got a thousand horsepower of thrust that I can use in small movements without even thinking to offset that. So no, I've flown in uh, in airfields uh, around airfields when they closed it formally or closed them formally because of crosswinds, and we didn't even notice. Yeah, no, wind, wind, wind is an easy one for us actually. It's interesting. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought that. Mm. Wouldn't have thought that at all. <clears throat> Which industry are you getting the most interest from with it? Uh, well, uh, entertainment, uh, corporate speaking, events, um, and the military, I guess. That's, uh, yeah, and, the, and search and rescue as well. Although search and rescue is tricky because, um, you know, they're not, they're, they're, by definition, those kind of people are not flush with lots of money and therefore the kind of money you really need to go and do a proper explora exploration of what we can do, they should be spending their resources on conventional search and rescue rather than uh, doing too much in the way, way of experimenting with us. But, um, yeah, I, I would say the, the the main list I gave you there. So on the, on the search and rescue side, I'm assuming uh, that de definitely looking at it from a getting to people stranded quickly front, but also potentially rescuing people with it. No, so th there's a film we want to shoot at some point with a big heavy lift drone company, which um, I, I should probably keep secret, but. The, the scenario that we imagine is one where you're driving a Land Rover across the Lake District, you're trying to look for this down, you know, this, this broken legged casualty on the hillside somewhere. It, I don't care if it's dark and it's raining, it's snowing, the river's in spate. You could open the back of the Land Rover, clip in the jet suit, take off, fly, you know, 10 feet above any terrain, whether it's snow or rivers or whatever, go up. You don't want to go up a vertical cliff because, again, if you get a failure, I mean, you can do it, but it'd be ideal if you're going up a, a modest slope. You find the casualty, 
you land, you shut down, you do that brilliant thing that humans are good at, the triage, the talking to the casualty, stabilizing them, you get the folding uh, stretcher out, you stabilize them, and then you dial in the heavy lift drone. That comes in, hovers, you clip them in, and then you press go to home, and the heavy lift drone takes them home. That heavy drone has also brought your spare fuel in to just top up your fuel, and then you fly back. So that I, I see it as that kind of partnership. You could build the suit to lift heavy lift, but I mean, do you really want a big heavy casualty even hanging between your legs on a tether i mean you know i don't want to be a human chinook <laughs> um, i just don't think that's a suitable use of the technology really so it's more just giving the human being that complete three-dimensional space freedom whether you're providing top cover or you're finding a casualty is there is there room for like a payload on it what i mean in the current state it is now yeah or they they are now if you want the carrier load could you? Yeah. And what would that be? So it depends on the pilot weight and the fuel weight and the air temperature. So if it's a really hot day and you've got a very heavy pilot carrying a lot of fuel, you've really eroded that payload down with the current suit. The, the Mark III one we're talking about will have 20 kilos more lift capacity than this one for the same weight suit, which is going to be pretty crazy. So, um, But this one, yeah, on a normal, I don't know, 15, 16 degree centigrade day with a, you know, an athletic lighter than well so i don't know maybe average uh you know young lad in the marines or whatever the powers let's say who's maybe 85 kilos um maybe not, it's not massively heavy but you know athletic kind of build uh they can probably carry 15 kilos of extra gear so from a military point of view it's a sort of light fighting order range so it's not massive but that's why we're building the mark three one because you add another 20 on top of that that's a lot how are you on the Mark III? How are you managing to get an extra 20 kilos on it, but keep the same weight on the suit? Yeah, we're swapping out the big rear engine for uh, the next generation of engines that we've been playing with, which not only uh, generate more thrust, uh, but also, and it just barely sounds believable, and I had to start them myself to see it, but they start instead of 60 seconds, so that's cold, jet engine sitting there, press go, 60 seconds later, you've taken off. I, I still think that's quite impressive. These new ones start in 12 seconds. So you literally take off in 12 seconds. In fact, to be honest, they're quoted at eight seconds, but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt and saying it's more like 10 to 12. <laughs> so, so from an entertainment point of view, it's insane. I could be talking to you now wearing a suit and I could say, right, I'll, okay, do you want me to go and fly? Okay, just give me a second. I'll fly over. I'll stick that flag over there and then I'll fly back. And I could literally, in the time I'm still talking, now be flying and then back again. It's ridiculous. They don't sound real. They sound like a Star Wars soundtrack. People are not going to believe what we post. They're amazing. <laughs> well, people don't believe the old stuff. I saw no, that. I, I, I love it. You must, do you read YouTube comments and stuff like that? They're, they're yeah, quite, sometimes. Yeah, I, they're, right. they're, 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 it's quite pleasing that, that there's relatively few people who now still think it's fake. Because, I mean, honestly, I, if it was fake, and if you Google Richard Browning or Gravity or Jet Suit, and you see the pages and pages and pages of me or one of my team, showing up all over the world. I mean, can you imagine the effort that would have had to gone into fake that? That would be more impressive than a jet suit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's also quite, I think it's a, it's like, it's a nice thing to, to be working on something that people don't believe is real. It makes it all the more amazing in what, in what yeah, you're doing. I guess so. I mean, we, we, but it's still a small part of me, slightly frustrated sometimes, but I, I know <laughs> you don't comment to those kind of comments. Um, we had a guy who turned out, he drove for like, like, 12 hours across the united states to come and see one of our training sessions i mean he wasn't paying you know it's quite expensive to come and do the training session to make it worth us doing it um he drove for 12 hours just to come and watch it so he could put it on insta live to somebody who was hounding him on it on social media saying it's bullshit you're all idiots i don't know why you think it's real it's not and he drove 12 hours across the united states to film it for five minutes and go look there it is and they got back in the car and drove away again so, i think uh, i do the yeah. same I think I did. I met I met a flat earther at a wedding once. Like, oh God, unbelievable! Mate, going back up the suit, right? <clears throat> from the on the sort of the engineering side of things, from when you trigger, if that's the right word, what 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 is it doing in the gap in that eight to twelve second or sixty second gap, depending yeah. on which model? In that gap, why does it take time before you get enough thrust to take off? Yes, because it's quite. It's not quite Tony Stark, Iron Man, immediate impulse kind of thing. Um, oh, yeah. So to start, so it, this is the same whether it's a, a you know a gas turbine on a jetliner that you're going to go on holiday with. Uh, back in the day, back four weeks ago, <laughs> um, 
So to start a jet engine, what you're doing essentially is you, you, you squirt a bit of fuel in, you ignite it, you've now got heat. Now you blow air into the area, like you're puffing air onto a fire in a, in a hearth, okay? And the compressor starts blowing air at the fire. Well, guess what? The fire gets bigger. That starts blowing hot air out the back of the engine. Then you bit more fuel, bit more air, bit more fuel, bit more air. You're now building more and more and more heat. Now there's enough hot air wafting out the back end of the engine that as it goes past the turbine blades, it's now starting to push on the turbine blades and push them out the way as it's going out the exhaust. The clever thing is that those turbine blades are attached to the compressor. So instead of the electric motor turning the compressor, which is how you start it, the electric motor eventually goes, hang on a minute, I'm not needed anymore. I, I'm turning, you know, the compressor is turning already because of it's being blown by the, um, the turbine wheel at the back. And then you're just building and building and building essentially like a constant kind of explosive ignition of the fuel um, inside the combustion chamber that there's so much hot air blasting out of the engine that that acceleration of air is creating the thrust. So to nurture that process gently up to idle ready for you to squeeze the trigger and accelerate it up even more to 120,000 rpm um, that takes usually 60 seconds which is a little computer brain gently managing the exhaust gas temperature the fuel input and the rpm it's the process that frank whittle so frank whittle uh, blew himself up several times in 1944 and three and two um, trying to perfect which gave birth to the modern jet engine I was, going to, I was going to ask, who was Frank Whittle? Okay, okay, I got you. So Sorry. he had to do it without the benefit of computers, which were very good, which are very good now at managing that very fine process. Because you can imagine, more fuel, more air, more fuel. That process can accelerate exponentially until then it just blows itself out. You know, it just, just gets unsustainable. So um, our engines, we're using a little computer brain, are very good at getting that quickly up to speed. How is the new one potentially doing it at 12 seconds then? Um, oh, this is all supposed to be a bit secret, really, but I mean, what the hell. Um, it, it uses a very clever um, spray uh, atomizer, so it sprays fuel in a mist and then uses what looks like a taser in terms of a spark to ignite it. So it, it just goes a lot more aggressively for a much more intense fire very quickly, all contained inside the engine. Um, and the worst case scenario is it just goes out because it's got the mix wrong. Um, but it's just a much more aggressive way of building the fire up. At the moment, it's a sort of injector and a glow plug like you get in a you know, diesel car. So it's, it's a lot more pedestrian. Is that going to result in a, a higher potential top speed on it? Um, well, it, it's, the engines are also rated for a higher power, which if you flatten out, because the whole evolution towards wing development is our big frontier. Again, you can see that on YouTube and stuff. In fact, there's a really cool edit I'm going to put out soon with a lot of our wing development stuff on there. Um, yes, more power will, in theory, may mean more speed. I mean, I, I, I'm only scraping the surface at 85 miles an hour when we set the Guinness World Record uh, for that. Um, we, we've got a greater thrust to weight, weight ratio than any known jet fighter. So, if that makes sense. So, so make the, sense, yeah. yeah. As a percentage of my body weight and the weight of the equipment... <laughs> the thrust we generate is 1.3, one, almost 1 1.4 times my, the, or the static weight of the flight system. Whereas the best jet fighters in the world, mo some of them aren't even over one. In other words, they can't even stand on their tail and keep going up. Um, so yeah, we're, we can go extremely quickly, but then we're back to the safety thing. We have to get that squared away if we're gonna get much faster. Yeah, absolutely. Have, uh, have you had any lunatics like, Jeb Corliss, other wingsuit nutters approach you about anything to do with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and some of them have done flight training with us and stuff, and you learn pretty quickly what it's about. So, you know, people saying things like they want to jump out of an airplane, fire it up, and then kind of do a superhero landing and stuff. I mean, you know, you learn pretty quickly when you get in the suit what it can do and what it can't and what will be sensible. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking more in terms of, I mean, you talked about wings earlier, we talked about payload and weight. I mean, a wingsuit skydiving wingsuit as a great example of a super lightweight but almost rigid structure when you're at speed that can, you can the, glide with that's what we use so that's what i used for the guinness world record i used a uh, wingsuiting inspired leg wing because uh, then that lifts my legs up. <sighs> the rear engine is then going to propel me forward and it's great because if you don't want it to be there you just close your legs and it's it's gone 
So, um, so that, that's been a big win. That, that's, that's made a huge difference. The next frontier is an upper body wing. And again, there's some clips online of showing us experimenting with them. The biggest problem with those is they generate so much lift, you just rock it upwards and you don't have the aerodynamic control to bring yourself down again very easily. So you have to drop out of the airflow and keep modifying. So, um, yeah, there's loads more coming in this area. Where do you see, where do you see gravity industries being in, in five years time? Well, it's our race series, which is the big thing. So we were due to do a big race event in Bermuda uh, in March, uh, but got paused because of the virus challenge. Um, and yeah, I, I'm having a big Red Bull Air Race style touring kind of race series, I think, is our, is our sort of near term goal, because it just has such an impact on people, let alone when you've got the competitive element and the perception of risk of, you know, people racing against each other. But you do it over water, so it's safe. Um, I think that that's that's our kind of focus at the moment, and all, and all the military stuff is running in parallel and client training. Yeah, uh, I think a race would be pretty a uh, pretty cool. I can't watch that. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think our attitude is I'm not going to bother trying to sell people on it. I've done some races with several other pilots before, and it was the most intense and awesome experience of my life. And even if a fraction of that comes across on camera, um, it'll be mind blowing, and I'm just going to let the footage we hopefully shoot in Bermuda, probably this time next year, at the rate we're going with this virus. Um, I'll let that footage do talking, you know, do its own talking. Um, it's going to be pretty epic. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. What's been the most difficult exhibition you've done? Well, the most, yeah, the most difficult, uh, yeah, exhibition you've done in the suit. Well, the most challenging. I mean, technically, and um, it's not so much down to usually what the technicality of the flight is. Um, I managed to execute really quite difficult maneuvers before i mean i we we actually i need to post this as well we, we posted up recently some um navy exercises flying to and from boats and things they're very, really easy actually it, it, the, the most challenging aspect is usually if you then go to start to you know start up the engines and it's live tv or thirty thousand people in an arena or whatever the challenging thing is is the fear of finding one of the engines has a freak problem like that glow plug I mentioned, very rarely that glow plug can fail, like, you know, a spark plug failure in a car. And you're standing there and one of the engines doesn't start. And then you think, well, you know, there's 30,000 people and, and several million people on TV expecting me to be flying in, in you know, 60 seconds. Um, so I really hope the second attempt to start them really works. You know, it, it's that kind of thing that's stressful. Luckily, whenever we've had that kind of problem, we've managed to get around it quick enough to not have an issue. But it's the fear of that happening in an irrecoverable way is is usually the biggest burden mm. the uh, the jet suit mate obviously your main focus with gravity industries is yeah. there is there other things you're working on with the company aside from the jet suit at the no, moment I mean, there's, there's so many aspects to it um it's it's a it's a sprawling beast in terms of a company now from r d to events to speaking to patenting to regulation to military to you know i mean it's just it's massive so no, it's keeping me more, more than busy enough. I mean, what, what one minor positive about the COVID-19 issue is that I've got all this unexpected time in the lab here. My, my technical team are all on you know, Skype and Zoom and whatever. And as I say, I was up at the test site earlier by myself um, doing some sound testing. We're actually getting a load more R&D done than we would usually get done because we would, we would have done 20 events by now in the time that the virus has had us locked down. So, so actually, you know, focusing on R&D, in the summer or in the spring in this case um is actually quite a nice pleasant surprise we usually get most of it done in the winter when the events aren't running so um uh, no i'm more than busy enough with the schedule at the moment that's good mate no it's good. no it's uh it, it's super interesting and um i'm, I'm just conscious of your time looking at it now um right. when when this is uh when this covid situation is done what's going to be your first focus when it's when it's back in when it's well, when I, we're I allowed out again I, I, I think it's going to be a gradual releasing of the rules to a degree. So I think the first thing we can do is have clients back. So, you know, one or two people join probably just me at our test site, you know, three people gathering, keeping a social distance from each other. That seems like that'll be the, the easiest of the list of things to achieve when we are allowed to kind of do that. And so I think we'll crack on with about 150 people on our wait list to do flight training. Um, and, then we've got some military training we need to do uh, and also that will give us an opportunity to do more testing of our next suit as well i think getting out to do kind of high profile public events and stuff i think i think i could see that taking until next year 
for those to come back on. So um, yeah, the race series might might get uh, postponed because of that. Um, but yeah, we can keep ourselves very busy in the meantime. Yeah, I imagine. Right, we'll um, we'll uh, we'll we'll bring it to a close. What? Uh, cool. Thank you. So, where can people follow what you're doing, and uh, how can people find you? Yeah, I, I mean, most social media, if you look for the phrase take on gravity, uh, you can find us with lots on Instagram. Uh, the take on gravity page on Instagram is pretty big. Um, there's my one on there as well, but you can see that linked in most of the posts. It's Richard M. Browning, but just look for the take on gravity one and you find me in there. Uh, the, the big area we're really pushing at the moment is YouTube because you can just get away with much longer films. and There's loads of behind the scenes footage. We've got about I don't know, a thousand hours of amazing footage from a hundred events all over the world, which we've never really shown people because we were too busy. So I'm slaving away, editing them as best uh, I can with my team to uh, pull that out and share it with people. So that's under Gravity Industries. So if you go to YouTube and look for Gravity Industries, um, then uh, yeah, hopefully you'll like what you see. Out of left field, do you know, I've recently become uh, a member of TikTok. <laughs> yeah, with, yeah, me too. So it was set up by one of my team. <laughs> Yeah, but one of my team, um, I like we say a member. I don't think that's that. I think that's showing our age. I don't think if we were younger, we wouldn't be calling ourselves members of TikTok. Um, User. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I just funny you say that. So one of my team set it up uh, like at the beginning of the year and posted a couple of things and just thought, oh, it's kind of fun. Because of the lockdown, I picked it up a week ago and I've gone from 5,000 to 10,000 followers in four days. I think the biggest clip I put on there is on one and a half million views. It is the wild west of social media. It's hilarious. Um, again, if you look for Take On Gravity, for all of you TikTok followers out there, um, I don't really know what to make of the platform, really. It's hilarious. I'm <laughs> well, I... It's a... Yeah, go on. Go on. I was no, I, say, I, 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 I'm told it's a Chinese spying platform. But anyway, never mind. Well, they I, spy I think, what they like on me. I think everything is these days. Like, yeah. we're record... <laughs> yeah. I'm recording this on a Huawei. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they know all about it then. But it's my no, thing, right. isn't it? So... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I for, man, I stayed away from it. All I knew is a, is a kid's video platform. But then a friend of mine, uh, he's ex-military, and he's got a, he's got a, a company called Sinita's Guild, which is just a, it's a, a it's you know, it's like one of these, it's an apparel company, clothing, all the rest of it. But it's built around you know, selfless sacrifice, blue light services, military. It's really cool. And uh, I saw he was on TikTok, and I, I just, I, I messaged him. I started slagging him off TikTok, but he, <laughs> yeah. he made a really good point. He said, "Mate, I know." He said, "But he made a really good point." He said, "It's, it's a platform crying out of positivity, and uh, videos are brilliant on it, much like Instagram is, right?" Yeah, the I, I don't sort of think it might herald the end of Instagram, maybe. I don't know, you know, but the, the, well, possibly you might be right actually, because it's pretty addictive. The, the difference with TikTok is for the likes of ourselves, you, me, and and yeah. him, we are able through interest in videos and especially the stuff you do is that we're essentially communicating because the majority of those users of, the, of that platform are the generation below us yeah and the, and below that we're essentially communicating with um able to communicate with the generation below yeah. and get me interested in whatever we do it's perfect for you perfect yeah. perfect yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll wait i'll wait for your dance i'll wait for your dance on those <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i've done that <laughs> richard it's been an absolute pleasure mate no i appreciate no, your time Pleasure's all mine. No, and uh, good luck, uh, good luck with the future. Thank you very much. You too, you too. I'll buy a beer and meet up. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're done, mate. That was good. Cool. cool. Thanks very much. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, well, have a good evening. Oh, you, you, you too. No, 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 it's fine. All done. The other, the other podcast. I'll drop me an email. You have a look. Either get back to me or not. I, I know you're mega busy, mate. But I'll, okay. ju I'll just send the email. That's, that's cool. Cool, lovely. Thank you. And if you can, if you're going to put it on YouTube, if you can link to the take. Oh, sorry, it's Gravity Industries. If you can put that in there, that'd be great. Gravity right. Industries and Take on Gravity. Gravity Industries is the YouTube one. Take on Gravity works for most other platforms. Okay. Right. So yeah. So what I'll do is on. Just on, mention on the, it in the description if you can. Okay. Sweet. Mate. Okay, cool. Joy. Thanks, bud. Thanks, you, mate. Cheers. Bye-bye.